So we're starting off our series uh, today thinking about immigration, which would fall into the Atlantic Canada and the world theme. I'd like to thank Harold, Howard Ramos from Sociology and Anthropology, Ruben Zayadi from the Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence at Dalhousie, and Laurie Harrop at the School of Public Administration, who helped to shape today's panel. These discussions started several months ago, and we started thinking which policy discussions we'd like to have for this inaugural session. So it's been three and a half years since the Ivney Report recommended that Nova Scotia triple the amount of immigrants to the province to counteract the effects of the province's declining birth rate and out-migration. The Atlantic provinces also host some of the least diverse populations in the country, with only a small portion of Atlantic Canadians being born outside of Canada. Last year, Nova Scotia has been one of the, uh, ha had seen one of the highest levels of immigration in decades, but it's still quite short of the Ivney Report goal. So with the Atlantic region looking to diversify and attract more skilled immigrants, the federal government announced the Atlantic Immigration Pilot in 2016. And I'll also, also mention, just as an aside, that next week we're having a panel discussion on the Ivney Report. So to a certain extent, what we're talking about today relates directly to the issues that we're going to be talking about next week with Ivney, because a, a key plank of Ivney is immigration. So to help to discuss the pilot, however, um, its aims and potential, we've invited a distinguished panel with a variety of perspectives. We have representation from the federal government, the provincial government, private sector, not-for-profit. All these organizations play an important role in the pilot. We also want to open up the discussion beyond Nova Scotia and think critically about international trends in other Western countries on questions of immigration and settlement. Uh, regrettably or uh, happily, I'm not sure, but brevity is key today for our panelists. Uh, each panelist is given eight to nine minutes to speak. I think that's right, Katie, eight to nine minutes to speak. Yes, eight to nine minutes. Uh, which I realize is short, but uh, we're going to force them to get to the point quickly from their organizational perspective because we want, one, to provide as many points of view as we can for the panel. We have these long the panels or these uh, uh, lots of members of these panels, uh, but we also want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. So that's why uh, we've uh, limited the speaking time to eight to nine minutes per, per person. Um, I'll make brief notes about each of the panelists before they speak. So I'll insert myself after each panelist. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Sean Morancy. Sean joined Citizenship and Immigration Canada as a Foreign Service Officer in 2001 and has served in positions in Canada and overseas in Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. Sean is currently the IRCC Employee Liaison Officer in Atlanta, Canada. And today, Sean will be given the task of explaining the program to us and making comments about its progress to date. Thanks so much for coming, Sean. We're looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thanks for the Kevin Institute for the opportunity. Uh, right, so like Kevin said, uh, you heard that part of the Atlantic growth strategy that was uh, announced by uh, the Atlantic premiers and the federal Sean, government. Pardon me, we're going to need a microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right, so make sure everybody can hear me. The, uh, so like I was saying, the Atlantic Growth Strategy was announced uh, roughly around Canada Day 2016. The Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program is part of that overall strategy. It's one piece of it, and you're probably familiar there are some other planks around entrepreneurship and export development and investment and these kinds of things. And the immigration piece is what's been rolled out as the pilot. Um, as the name says, it's a pilot, it's something new. We're trying something uh, a little bit different from a federal perspective by trying to work with our other key partners around the immigration program to create a new opportunity that will address some of the particular challenges that are present in Atlantic Canada. Um, the idea being to address some labor market needs, uh, help the long-term economic growth and ensure some continued economic success for Atlantic Canada by allowing an opportunity for employers to attract the skilled labor that they need and then bring together some of the different key components that we think will enhance the long-term retention of those immigrants in the region, in Atlantic Canada. So we would say it complements the existing federal and, and provincial programs with a few key elements that are sort of new and different. Um, there are some key parts that focus, for example, on retaining international students as graduates of, of uh, post-secondary education in Atlantic Canada and offering them an enhanced opportunity to find employment 
in the region and then stay in the region permanently as new permanent residents, new immigrants to Canada, by uh, allowing employers as well to focus on the particular skill sets that they need to attract and retain to help sustain and grow their businesses and provide opportunities for other Atlantic Canadians in the region. So some of the key things that we tried to bring together in the development of the pilot between ourselves as the federal government, the sort of provider of immigration programs and the manager of access to Canada, in conjunction with our colleagues from the province, who of course are in each of the provinces, the four Atlantic provinces, um, closer to the ground, so to speak, and have an already a, a good relationship with employers uh, and service providers in the region. Service providers uh, that we fund and that the province funds to provide settlement services to immigrants like ISANS uh, that Jerry is here representing today as well, to try and re to bring together the different pieces that uh, some research shows are key to retaining immigrants in a, in a place and helping them integrate successfully and durably where they are. So not just employment, right, but also the services that they, they have available to them to help with the other aspects. One of the things that uh, the program, I guess well, I'll explain how it works like I was asked to do. Um, it starts with what we call employer designation. It's referred to as an employer-driven program, right? So everything begins with an employer in Atlantic Canada wanting to participate in the program, wanting to use immigration to, like I said, address those labor needs that they might have. So they are then allowed to apply for basically entry to the program, what we call designation. And that piece is actually managed by our provincial colleagues. And the employer will then have to show that they meet certain criteria to be allowed to participate. So a clean record on things like labor law and previous employment of foreign workers, uh, as the case may be. Once the employer is designated, that's where then we expect them to go out and about, whether in Canada or abroad or both, to recruit the labor that they're looking for. Find the people that they need to fill the gaps they have. Once they've identified candidates, then again, we work with one of the other partners in the process, which would be the settlement service provider agencies, to look at the candidate that the employers identified and their family, see what their needs might be in terms of settlement services, develop a plan to provide those once that person arrives in Canada as a new immigrant, and then uh, be ready then to welcome them and help them start that process of integration. Once those things are put together, the employer then takes that package, goes back to our colleagues at the provincial level to say, I've identified my candidate, here is their settlement plan and needs all assessed and we're ready to go. The province takes a final look and decides whether the various criteria are met. If that's yes, that's where the province issues what we call an endorsement for that particular candidate. And then it's actually only at that point where the candidate is endorsed by the province that they are then able to actually come to our department at the federal level to apply for something, right? And so there may be two, there's the first track would definitely be to apply for permanent residence, so landed immigrant status in Canada. That's the final goal of the program, right, is to bring permanent uh, residents to Atlantic Canada. If the employer has need of them on a shorter term and a more immediate basis, right, there's somebody that they've recruited that they're looking to get on the job as quickly as possible, we also have the opportunity for that person to apply for a work permit in order to get into Canada as a temporary resident and start working for that employer while they wait for the permanent resident process to run uh, its full course. So the department is committed on the permanent resident processing side to complete the processing of these applications in the pilot in six months or less for uh, the vast majority of those cases, which if you're familiar with the time scales on permanent residence applications and, and immigration, um, is certainly a bit faster than we have been in a historical context, but is consistent with some of our new uh, program <coughs> offerings that are managed by some of our other new systems since 2015. So we've taken the pilot and put it on even level with our other just-in-time immigration system that we call Express Entry to, to reflect the importance that these new candidates have for employers in Atlantic Canada and to make sure that we give them the best chance for success by not making them wait too long to become permanent residents. So in terms of 
how we're going so far. Uh, Kevin asked me to sort of make some comments about how, where we're at. Uh, it's still very early days. It's important to keep in mind that as a three-year pilot that's only just begun this year, we're in about month five of actually running it and having it open for applications out of a, a projected three-year window. But I think all of the provinces and at the federal level, we are pleased with the interest that's been shown and the enthusiasm of a lot of employers. It's been helpful, I think, in expanding the uh, awareness of immigration programs because there's been a bit of a, a flashy launch to it. It's attracted some attention, a lot of commentary, so that some employers that maybe hadn't considered the use of immigration in the past now are starting to realize that there are new options available, but also allows us to open a conversation to explore other possible immigration options, not just the Atlantic Pilot. It's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution. But uh, certainly we're pleased that there are a number of employers who seem to share the vision for the program of helping attract people who will durably integrate in their region to be able to stabilize some of the demographic issues in particular parts of Atlantic Canada and provide a stable sort of workforce going forward. Um, there are some issues, of course, challenges going forward. We're continuing to try to address the information requirements and the newness of the program for employers, uh, especially those who haven't used immigration before. Right? It's an ongoing process to provide them what they need to know to be able to manage their participation and make the best use of it. Uh, immigration is a complex business, but uh, we're doing our best and continuing to enhance our efforts to reach out to them to make sure they are aware of it, how it works, how it can work for them, what they need to know to be able to use it. And so we've, we've implemented a number of things that are certainly enhancements over our usual service to be able to give them more direct communication and uh, get what they need to know in the immediate term to be able to make the best use of their options. So I think I will leave it there then. Thank you. So that will sort of set the ground. We'll turn it over to uh, Kevin Gale. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sean. Uh, next up is uh, Suzanne Lee. She's the executive director of the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration. In that capacity, she leads a coordinated approach to advancing Nova Scotia's immigration priorities, leveraging partnerships with business and community leaders. Suzanne. I'm a bit shorter than John. Can I move this? Or can you hear me? Is that okay? That's good? Okay. <laughs> Let's not make it too loud, though. I have a very squeaky voice. So thank you, Dr. Quigley. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm a Dow grad, so I feel I have to say that. I actually took classes in this room when the building opened. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here to talk about the pilot and to give the provincial government's perspective. Um, and so I'll, ta I'll actually take a step back, if I can, and talk a bit about the work that the province has done on immigration, uh, setting the stage for the Atlantic Immigration Pilot, sort of getting back to the question of, are we ready? So I started at the office in 2014, and as Dr. Quigley mentioned, at the time the Ivan Commission was just released, um, and it painted a pretty bleak picture of the future for Nova Scotia. Um, and so I'll tell you, every day when I drove home from work, I turned on the radio, and it was all about immigration, how immigration was going to solve Nova Scotia's issues. Um, and while we've been talking about demogra demographics, for some time in Nova Scotia, it really uh, sort of galvanized the discussion. And um, as an MPA grad, I worked with the Department of Finance right after the Ivany report came out to do some, um, uh, some forecasting of, of population. And if we got to, if we said, let's get 7,000 people per year right now into our province, what would it look like? And I'm not an MPA student anymore, so I'll give you my really formal graph, but 30 years out, <laughs> uh, population was going down, and with the 7,000 target from Ivany, it went from down to just slightly less down. Um, so we knew right away that we couldn't do it alone, that it wasn't just about government, and it was really, the really nice thing about the Ivany report is that it wasn't just about government. In that report, it was sort of a call to action for all of Nova Scotia. Uh, so we set out right away to figure out what our partners knew about immigration, how the system was working, um, what, what our partners could tell, about, tell us about it. Organizations like ISANS, organizations like CME, Chambers of Commerce, immigration lawyers, the, the people that are closest to us, uh, what they knew. Because we knew that we needed them in order to meet the needs, uh, or the objectives that we had for growth. So since then, we've been proactive, we've been aggressive, 
Um, and we've been very action oriented. So as we build um, uh, action plans, we've been delivering as we go, uh, trying to sort of demonstrate uh, progress. So we've enhanced our nominee program. We've led the country with new and innovative streams. Uh, Sean referenced uh, the federal government's express entry system. We were the first province in Canada to launch a stream. Uh, we stepped up our online presence. You can now uh, apply to our programs online and we're doing more work there. And we've talked with hundreds, um, in fact, probably thousands of Nova Scotians in communities across the province about, about immigration, about the benefit that immigration can, can bring to their community and what role they can play uh, in immigration. We've been extremely focused on maximizing the entire immigration system. While we control the provincial nominee program, we're very interested in making sure that if somebody can apply to Express Entry or to another program, that that's great because that means another spot we have under PNP and that means two people are coming rather than just one. We've been focused on being quick, on being innovative, and on being connected with businesses and communities so that we can be responsive to their needs. So as, as communities, as university presidents, as others have identified gaps in the immigration system, we've responded very quickly and been able to turn that around. And I tell you all of this because the question is, is Nova Scotia ready? Um, and so because of the aggressive groundwork, because of the action we've been taking, because of the changing discourse and changing narrative, I would say, in Nova Scotia, uh, my answer is an overwhelming yes, we are ready. And so when the federal government first approached us about the pilot, probably a year and a half ago now, uh, we went straight out and started talking to our employers again about how the system was working for them. And if we had an opportunity to change things, if we had an opportunity to do something different, uh, what could it look like? And so we heard across the board that labor needs are impacting growth, uh, that the temporary foreign worker program, the CAPS and our PNPs and other programs weren't necessarily meeting their entire need. Um, Companies were telling us, I recall very vividly a conversation with a company who told us they had to pass up a major contract because they didn't have the confidence that they could get the human capital they needed to do the job. And as a Nova Scotian, the economic challenges of that for me were, uh, were staggering. They told us the immigration system is too complex. And they told us, especially uh, SMEs told us, that they need help. So if you're a circuit board maker, but you're also the HR manager and you're the CEO of the company, you don't have the time to figure out which immigration stream is the right one uh, to bring your candidate in. They told us that they're willing to work with our fantastic settlement partners uh, to make sure that they're ready to hire international talent. But most of all, they told us they are ready. They're ready to come along with us on the next phase of, of shaping immigration in Nova Scotia. And so we're absolutely optimistic about the Atlantic Immigration Pilot. We're very excited about the potential for growth to immigration in our province. We're really interested in testing out a new model to ensure, to see if we can enhance retention with a greater collaboration between employers, settlement partners, the province and the federal government. Um, we've got 74% retention in Nova Scotia right now, but we know there's room to grow that. Um, and we're excited that it's employer driven. Uh, giving employers another tool to connect with international talent and giving us another program to offer in sort of the puzzle of immigration. We're really happy to be working with organizations like ISANS, with organizations like the Halifax Partnership, the Cape Breton Partnership, and the Western Regional Enterprise Network, who we've just uh, uh, signed contracts with to help navigate the immigration system, to help those SMEs who have five jobs in the run of a day. And we're really encouraged by the way that the federal government and the provincial government are really working together side by side in this, pr in this program, trying to make it as simple and as easy as possible uh, for employers and applicants. Uh, one of the staff in my office um, has a note on her board that says, we'll never make it easy, but let's make it as easy as we can. And so I'm really pleased with what we're seeing so far. Sean mentioned it's early days, um, but we're, we're already seeing an increase uh, from employers we've never talked to before in immigration that are using the system, which is incredibly encouraging. Um, and as we promote the pilot, as Sean said, it's, it's gotten a lot of profile. And as we're promoting the pilot, other programs are benefiting. So as I talked about, we're really interested in maximizing every opportunity somebody has to come to Nova Scotia. And already in our provincial nominee program, we're farther ahead than we've ever been before. Uh, so we're confident that, that both programs and the federal government's express entry programs are playing, complementing each other. 
Um, so in terms of Nova Scotia's progress so far, uh, we've got 200 employers that are approved to participate in the program. And those, as of Friday of last week, 80 job offers had been endorsed for candidates, real human beings who are going to now go to Sean's office and then mo hopefully move to Nova Scotia. Um, and so these are jobs in important sectors uh, that employers, despite trying, um, haven't been able to fill with Nova Scotians in sectors like IT, hospitality, manufacturing, healthcare, transportation, and, and finance. Um, so I think I'm getting a signal. Um, but all of that is to say that we're ready, we're excited, we're geared up, we're working as hard as we can. Uh, the entire office is, is jazzed and engaged. And although it's early days, we're really optimistic and uh, looking forward to working with the federal government and our partners on, on year two and year one and a half, year two and year three. Great, thanks Suzanne. Jerry Mills is the Executive Director of Immigration, Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, ISANS, to which is, we've already referred, which is the largest immigrant settlement agency in Atlantic Canada. Jerry has worked in the not-for-profit immigrant settlement sector for more than 27 years. Her career has been in the field of adult education and immigrant settlement. Jerry. Suzanne won't let me out. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I too am um, thrilled to be able to uh, come here and speak to you. Um, talking about AIP, it's really, really important to us as an organization. For those of you who don't know what ISANS is, Immigrant Settlement Association that provides a range of services uh, to people around business and language and initial settlement, the refugees, um, community development. So we have around about 200 staff uh, delivering service to about five and a half thousand clients each year. Our role in the AIP is to, um, to talk to employers about what settlement is and also to uh, provide the, um, uh, the needs assessment and then the settlement plans. So the way I've approached this is uh, trying to look at, is Nova Scotia ready? Uh, are many different areas of, the, uh, of Nova Scotia ready? So is business, are employers, um, is the government, uh, is the community, is ISANS ready? So in many ways, it doesn't really matter whether we're ready. <laughs> it's rolling out. Uh, it's already started. Um, early in the summer, we saw that uh, StatsCan told us that Nova Scotia has Canada's highest rate of people aged over 65. Um, and uh, compared to those aged under 14. Um, both uh, Sean and Suzanne talked about the Ivney Report. We know that the Ivney Report tells us that we need to increase immigration and that population growth uh, is critical to the, uh, to the well-being of the province. It's an imperative for Nova Scotia whether we're ready or not. It's not going to be the solution for all our demographic needs, immigration, but uh, nor is the AIP, but it's going to be part of it. Um, so is the government ready? Here, yeah, Suzanne, are you listening? <laughs> um, it's a priority for the provincial government. For a few years, we had ministers that had the portfolio um, of immigration as an add-on. That's not the case anymore. The government has worked hard and they've worked aggressively to increase immigration numbers, although we have still a long way to go to reach the Ivney Report recommendation of 7,500. During the Syrian Refugee Initiative, many of you will have seen what was going on there. The Nova Scotia government stepped up to assume their appropriate role. They did it because it was the right thing to do, but they also did it because it made economic sense for the province. They know that short-term investment brings long-term gains. We know that the 641 children who came in with the Syrian Refugee Initiative will do well, will do better than their Canadian-born peers. Immigrant integration has now become not only a priority for the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration, it's spread around different departments within the government. So we're now talking to people like business and labour and advanced education and um, health and community services. They know the stats that without immigration, there would be 50,000 today, right now, there will be 50,000 fewer people uh, working in the province. Um, that an internationally educated uh, professional is twice as likely to be working in their profession in Nova Scotia as in almost any other province. The AIP has the potential to bring in 800-ish 
people a year into Nova Scotia. That translates into around about 2,000 uh, people. So it's 800 principal applicants, 2,000. So if you, you know, bring a spouse and you bring um, one or two children, around about 2,000 folks. Um, those folks are going to come here. They're going to put their kids in school. They're going to buy goods and services. They're going to buy houses. They're going to buy cars. And they're going to purchase all the things that Nova Scotians make. Um, we need those folks. Is business ready? At ISANS for many years, we used to talk about uh, the challenge of getting businesses to hire immigrants. There are some who always got it. Um, and there will be business um, that uh, you're going to talk about, Mitch, who always got it. But there were many who didn't. They like the status quo. Um, Nova Scotian employers like people who they know. They like the people they went to school with. They like the people who are down the road and the people that um, their, their families know. But, you know, things have changed. Employers are now hurting. We knew that that was coming. They're hurting. They can't grow their business. They can't uh, put labor into their business. And for many years, I was asked to talk about the benefits of immigration. You know, why would we need Im immigrants? I never get asked that question anymore. My question, what I go and give presentations on is, what can I do? What can I do as a community? What can I do as a business and employer? What can we do um, to increase immigration? So the discourse has changed. Um, so are employers ready for AIP, the Atlantic Immigration Pilot? Um, well, Sean described it a little bit, and Suzanne described it a little bit. In our view, it's, there's a lot of touches. <laughs> There's a lot of touches. There's a lot of back and forth. The employers come to us and say, um, what is settlement? Uh, we tell them what settlement is. They go away, and then they, um, they, uh, they develop their case and go in, uh, to the Office of Immigration, and they get uh, to be designated. And then they arrange for the candidate to come to us. And then the candidate is, uh, gets a needs assessment settlement plan, and then they go with that, and the candidate is endorsed. There's a lot of touches going back and forth. So we're talking about that and looking at uh, whether we can help with that. And the employers haven't even begun the um, settlement responsibilities yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are organizations like us, like ISANS, that can help, but I have to say we're all trying to figure this out together. Who are these AIP clients? Uh, what are their needs? How long is it going to be before they get there? Do they have spouses? What are the needs of the spouses? The principal applicant will have the job. That's part of the, the process, but the spouse probably will not have a job, and so there's a lot of work still to do. Is the community ready? Three factors contribute to people coming and people staying in a, in a place. Job, family, community. We should not underestimate that last one. Certainly there are communities in Nova Scotia that have got it. You've seen probably on the, in the news the last uh, weekend about the Haddad, the chocolatier Haddad family uh, up in Antigonish. Um, they get it. But there are many in Nova Scotia for whom come from away and who's your father is still a common and familiar part of the vernacular that cuts people off. And although Halifax is more multicultural, has more ethnic communities in place, more resources, there are still people here who are suspicious of immigrants and suspicious of immigration. Is there a tipping point beyond which people are wary of voicing these concerns? Actually, I think there is, and I think the Syrian Refugee Initiative actually helped that. So, is ISANS ready? Are we ready? Well, I think we're getting there. <laughs> But uh, we still have work to do. As much as we can plan, we don't know how this is going to play out in terms of numbers, in terms of needs, resources, for how long. Honestly, we're used to this. Uh, we love the fact that this is a pilot. In the not-for-profit world, we love pilots. That means we can move things, we can change things. It doesn't work on Friday. Maybe we should change it on Monday. Not quite as easy as that, but uh, maybe. Um, and you can put in other ideas at the same time. To date, at ISANS, we've completed 309 needs assessments and settlement plans uh, for people who are immigrating through the AIP. 169 of those are people destined for Nova Scotia. Um, we're also doing them for the, um, for the other Atlantic provinces as well. We actually stopped counting the number of employers who have been uh, calling us. The biggest thing, I think, that we have going for us here in Nova Scotia uh, with regard to the AIP is that this is Nova Scotia. We know each other. Uh, we know the players. 
And I know that despite some of the challenges and frustrations that you might hear, the fact that um, the Institute can bring these people to the table, and we've already met each other before, and we know each other, and we've talked to each other before about this. Um, Nova, um, ISANS is a not-for-profit organization, and it's a service provider. But our new strategic plan, which we just launched in June, includes as one of the initiatives supporting the AIP. These are not just words on paper for us. This is really important for us. We have to translate this into action. And so uh, we're championing a more welcoming and inclusive province through this, uh, through this process with the AIP. Um, this failure is not an option for this one, honestly, for any of us. We're, it won't fail because we'll make it work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, next uh, up is Mitch uh, Raymond. He is uh, from Nova Scotia's Divisional Vice President of Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, which is Canada's largest trade and industry association and the voice of manufacturing and global business in Canada. An industry perspective. Mitch. All right. So thank you for having me here and definitely uh, being from the aerospace sector prior to, I have PowerPoint slides, so I, <laughs> I'm going to pitch a couple of things to you guys. Um, what's, what's great about being here and actually hearing the message from my, uh, my peers uh, here today is we're all on, on the same page in terms of the importance of this. I've, it's always interesting to get grounded in terms of these kind of, of events and be able to share with you exactly from a private sector what that really means. And the messages that I'm hearing, for example, with Jerry, uh, in, in the group here is really we need to work together on this. The Ivany report is just the beginning, as they say. There's many opportunities that we need to work together, private sector, government, uh, you know, non-government and, and such different organizations. So what I want to show here, I'm going to page down, is just to give you a, a, a gist of in terms of what manufacturing means to Nova Scotia here, because you need to understand those uh, basic things before you start understanding how important this, this program really is. So Nova Scotia is comprised of roughly 1,700 companies manufacturing various sizes, and a lot of them you probably are aware of. You know, when it comes to manufacturing here, it, it's, it's a cornerstone really for our, um, our economy. You know, manufacturing's been around since Nova Scotia's been around, and really the whole thing here is, you know, there's things changing within the dynamics of uh, the sector here. You know, competition is fierce, you know, global competition out there. So really, it's really challenging in terms of, you know, one common theme that we can say with, within the organizations that I'm dealing with here is skills, labor, and having the right people are an automatic uh, key component with what we need to be uh, having in place. Just to kind of give you the, the thing of what it means for Nova Scotia here is, um, you know, in terms of sales, you know, Nova Scotia alone is about 7.8 billion in terms of sales. The GDP, it's about 7.9 percent, but then there's the other spin-offs within what manufacturing actually adds to the value within the province here. Uh, it directly employs uh, 28, roughly 28,700 people, and that's not including the indirects, which can be as much as three times in terms of the direct impacts. Um, manufacturing also, when you look at it in terms of the median, it's really good paying jobs, and I'll put the pitch in actually next month is uh, manufacturing month where we're really going to try to showcase really what manufacturing here is in Nova Scotia because I came on as uh, the vice president uh, last year for CME, and it's amazing the opportunities. Uh, you know, I've been in manufacturing 25 years in the private sector, and it's always an amazing thing to actually go around in the middle of the valley somewhere and find an organization of manufacturing, and you say, wow, we actually have this in Nova Scotia. So, you know, this is something we need to be proud of as Nova Scotians. And really, um, you know, in terms of having the right people, it is an essential component to it. I want to talk about here because this lines up perfectly. When CME at a national level, we have what we call the Industries 2030 strategy. So this rolled out last year. Industries 2030 talks about double manufacturing and double uh, exports um, by the year 2030. And that's no easy task because when you look at here, manufacturing is pretty much either stagnant or in the past uh, probably 10 years have 
had some decreases. So if you're looking at doubling, guess what? You need to do you need to do things a little bit different, or should I say, a lot different, because you're looking at having the right people in place, the right technologies in place, and the right dynamics. So uh, CME nationally, we have this that we've been working with the federal governments, the provincial governments, to make sure that you know we can actually grow within it because. Like I said, competition is fierce in terms of uh, manufacturing in Canada and global markets. But you look at the bottom here is one of the key things, the pillar of building a skilled uh, workforce for growth. Uh, you'll see their uh, pr improved access to foreign tra uh, trained workers. We need to do that. You can't take that out of the equation and you can't deny the fact there that we need more people in this province to be able to do things. Um, one of the things, actually, as part of this industry's 23rd, just to kind of give you a little bit of heads up how important really this is to the manufacturing sector, is roughly 1,500 executives last year within uh, Canada was uh, surveyed in terms of what do you need, what do you look at in terms of growth, uh, in terms of the manufacturing sector. You know, so if you're looking at an investment here, is I'm going to tell you right now, there's some companies, um, before they even come to Nova Scotia, they check out the environment in terms of what what's in place, what do they need to operate. So it could be, for example, regulatory. It could be, for example, the tax rates, the bases, the uh, infrastructure set up. But as you can see here, actually, one of the key components they look at before they even come in here is, do you have the right people? Am I going to go set up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area and not have the right people and actually have to, you know, to, to bring out? So this is the kind of thing here is we need to be positioned uh, in Nova Scotia and Canada, make sure that when somebody comes knocking on our door, we're ready to take in, uh, in, to take in the business. Um, I just put it here because I want to actually, it's, we're going to be per uh, a lot covering some same topics here. But I, I like to always say that opportunities are challenges waiting for action. So guess what? You know, the whole thing is when we look at what's up against us, we can say it's a double-edged sword. You know, so certain things are going to be challenges, but if we work together to make sure that actually we're on the same page. Um, and the one Nova Scotia, what's important about that initiative there is, you know, even though you may look at it and say there's different, uh, you know, things that need to be done, it's, it's pulling people together and organizations and departments and everybody together to, to come up with one solution and not duplicate. So some of the things that we look at here, and I heard that, uh, from Jerry talking about uh, population, so I got a few graphs in here, but when you look at it here, there's different uh, statistical data that shows, okay, by the year, you know, 2040, 20, you know, 50, 2030s, and uh, that you're going to see different uh, labor market availabilities, you know, aging population. But if you don't act on it, it doesn't matter what year it's going to hit, it's going to happen here. So we need to uh, look at the, we need to actually look at bringing people in, and actually the other part is actually keeping uh, you guys and the youth of today in this province here. So when you have out migration happening and you're not bringing people in, you're, it's, it's a recipe for disaster in terms of not just business but uh, you know, society at large. Um, so I just put there, for example, labor market demands will exceed the supply in certain fields. So we have labor market study that shows certain domains of uh, 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 training and skilled people, we're not going to have enough because guess what, as a manufacturer, we're competing with construction, we're competing with the forestry, we're competing with different uh, organizations. So these are some of the things here we need to actually bring internally within the province here. Uh, increase, uh, increase opportunity to expand into global markets. You know, I can't stress enough when you've seen that 2030 is if we're going to actually grow, we need to bring in dollars from out of the province. If you just changed from one pocket to the other, really you don't get economic wealth. So one of the things that we're looking at here is we got to look at export uh, potentials. Uh, when it looks at uh, strategies here is we need to bring in individuals, for example, it says increase our economies around the IT, clean tech, oceans tech, and innovative applications. We need to be more, um, not you know, I hate to say it, certain places where we're more followers than leaders. I think we have everything in this province here that we can be leaders at a global level. Um, just wanted to show, if I was to look at uh, organizations out here, I just always put up the flag in terms of Acadia Sea Plants. You know, very innovative company, but there's a lot of organizations out there that if I was to look here, we can benchmark and say, for example, uh, at Acadia Sea Plants, most of their PhD, PhDs are actually from out of, uh, out of country because they recognize the talent they need to actually uh, compete in global markets and have the right resources uh, around innovation. 
Uh, the challenges that I see personally talking with companies, and I heard the same uh, similar thing, is there's a lack of awareness to the program. So the whole thing is we can roll things out and we can let people know. Uh, but the reality here is we have to collectively work together to make sure that uh, we're communicating, that we're working with our, our uh, end users to these. Because if, if nobody knows about it, or if they hear about it, and then all of a sudden, guess what? They got to run their businesses and you know, they'll lose focus on this one here. So we need to kind of bring that to light a lot more. Um, you know what, internal succession planning, I got to tell you, that's one of the things that I see here is most companies don't even know what they're going to need in the next couple of years, five years. It's bad enough to know what you need now. So how do you use a program like this uh, without leveraging those opportunities? And my time's up. I knew I, I, I'm bad at that, but, uh, um, and just a couple things, you know, rural Nova Scotia is going to be the hardest ones that hit out of this one here because I, one thing that we see here is actually uh, a lot of, migration to big city areas, so everybody wants to work in Halifax. I have a lot of manufacturers in the rural areas that are really struggling because guess what? You can bring as many people as you want, but rural areas really need to step it up in terms of making sure the offerings are there, the settlement plans that Jerry talked about, is that smaller areas have everything that uh, they, they can offer up to keep the resources where they need it. And I just want to, you know, definitely, you know, I'll put a, a shout it out for, uh, you know, Tarek. Uh, Jerry talked about this one here. They had their grand opening on the weekend. Very inspirational. I've been uh, working with Tarek in the past year. Very, you know, when you look at it here, there's a lot of success stories. Uh, and definitely that uh, Tarek and his family are that. You know, so the whole thing is when it's, people say, oh, we got to worry about jobs. Well, guess what? There's a lot of people coming here creating a lot of great jobs for Nova Scotians. So I uh, definitely want to recognize that because uh, of the great things that's uh, going on in the province. So, so that's it. I'm probably a minute over, but. <laughs> great. No, I think we're doing well in time. Uh, Ruben Zayati is the director of the Jean Monnet European Union Center for, uh, of Excellence and associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Dow. Ruben will give us a European perspective on questions of immigration and labor mobility. Ruben. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, welcome, everybody. So uh, with the time allotted, which is not a lot, I'm going to be talking about uh, the international perspective. That's how we started the conversation, but of course, because the time constraints are going to be talking about one example that is more pertinent to my uh, research that has to do with, uh, with Europe. You might wonder why, why Europe is a, is a sort of a, a counter, uh, sort of counterpoint to what's going on here locally. There are some interesting parallels between the, uh, what's going on in Canada, in Nova Scotia in, partic in particular, but in general Canada and in Europe, with issues regarding to the broad discourse about migration. In particular, th it has to do with the, the, the challenge that uh, Canada and but Nova Scotia in particular are facing uh, with, regard to, with regard to aging populations and the need for migration. Of course, the discourse about migration in Europe is different from the one that it, you have been in Canada. Canada is, you know, presents itself as a country of immigration. That's not the case for the majority of uh, European countries, although de facto they are a country of immigration. Um, so as, as I said, I want to provide a, an example on the ways in which, or one, one way in which Europe has tried to address the, this problem um, and some of, the, some of the challenges it has faced in, in doing so. so in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about a project that was introduced around 10 years ago that is called the, uh, the Blue Card. So it's not this, the same, exactly the same of what we're talking about here, the pilot, immigration pilot project, but it has some characteristics I think are interesting when we talk about the, 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 the similarities uh, similar, and the challenges that the, the two sides are facing. So the Blue Card... It's, uh, it's an idea that was introduced by the European Union, so the regional entity, that uh, uh, the club in which the majority of European countries are part of, to address exactly that, 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 that issue about uh, um, the, uh, the aging population and need for skilled migrants. You heard a lot probably about the, uh, the migration crisis in Europe, but that, that debate has been mostly based on the um, issue of irregular migration. But there's an ongoing debate in Europe as well 
has to do with legal migration and how uh, Europeans can attract skilled migrants to, uh, to the continent. And at the regional level, the, the blue card was presented as a way to address that problem. Um, and why is that a problem? Um, Europe, although for a lot of people is an attractive place to be, but when we talk about uh, skilled uh, migrants, it's not necessarily the, the first place where um, these individuals might uh, be going. In fact, uh, according to OECD um, uh, statistics, the, um, Europe only attracts 30%, 31% of uh, skilled migrants uh, compared to 57% of uh, North America, so Canada and, and the US. Um, so you can see that Europe has a, has a challenge in providing the, the, the context uh, the, uh, for migrants, skilled migrants to come into the continent. So as I said, the, the blue card was a, an attempt to address that issue. The, the, the basic, I'm not gonna go into details, but the basic idea is to join the, uh, the possibility of uh, entering the continent with a contract, but also attach to it the possibility of uh, permanent residency, something that in Europe is much more challenging and difficult than it is uh, in, in Canada and North, uh, North America more generally. Um, so this project uh, started, um, as I said, around uh, 10 years ago, and uh, the results have been underwhelming. Um, the, the, there are many reasons why it has been um, I mean, if you talk to your officials, we wouldn't say a failure, but a lot, most commentators would say it has been. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm gonna list some of the main reasons why it hasn't been as successful as the, um, it, was, uh, it was planned to be. First of all, the, the actual numbers of individuals who went through, applied, and got the, the blue card um, is by minimal. We're talking about, I mean, the numbers here varies because um, um, complex, well, I'm not explaining why that is the case, but anyway, there are, there are between 20 and 30,000, uh, which you think about the size of Europe, so the entire continent is quite uh, limited. And on top of that, the, the majority, we're talking about almost 90% of those uh, cards were um, issued by only one country, Germany. Um, there's also inconsistent uh, implementation of the, this uh, project across, the, across the, the continent, not just in terms of who issued those cards, but also how, uh, how the selection process took place. And then one issue that I think it's common to a lot of these projects, it's a complexity. As although in pa on paper it seems to be uh, relatively straightforward to think about, uh, you got an employer, you got an um, um, the, the government trying to support the matching employees and uh, employers, but in practice, it, it is a challenge. I mean, something that's been recognized by the speakers here. Um, and, and because of the, the need for regulation, again, because we're not talking about temporary migrants, we're talking about the possibility down the road to get uh, permanent residency, it adds another layer of uh, of bureaucracy and uh, Europeans being Europeans are not uh, known to be uh, mm, simple when it, uh, when it has to do with uh, bureaucracy. Uh, some people would say uh, Europeans invented bureaucracy. So that in practice has uh, meant that the process has been very uh, slow and as often happens when things become slow, a lot of people lose uh, interest in, in the project. There's an additional reason why the project failed um, is the fact that there's, there has there has been competition with national programs. I mean, the other, of course, here I'm, I'm comparing Europe, which is a region com, uh, composed of uh, individual countries with uh, a country and in a province. But I think there are interesting parallels here between the fact that you have different levels of, uh, uh, so different entities that potential least can compete for the same type of uh, migrants. Um, and in fact, that's what happened in Europe. Uh, in parallel to this regional uh, project, there has been, that were even before this, uh, the blue card was introduced, other programs, national programs, so for example, France and, and 
Italy had their own pro have their own programs to attract skilled migrants. So that was you know a competition. There was a competition. There was not necessarily a, uh, um, a positive one. So. Um, because of these challenges and the, 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 mostly the failure of this program, there's been an ongoing discussion about how to reform it. And uh, last year, the European Commission, uh, together with a representative of our member states, have tried to address some of the problems that uh, this pro project has faced uh, over the years. And uh, the key, and I think it's always the case when we talk about this type of projects, is to simplify the process. I think no matter how much you try to create a problem that is simple, it's going to be anywhere much more complex if seen from the perspective of those who have to uh, use uh, the, the, uh, this particular project. And the other thing that I want, another cautionary uh, um, tale that I want, cautionary a point that I want to make about the, uh, these projects with the European uh, experience in mind, is the fact that the politics and the economics are not always converging. Although there is a goodwill on the part, both of the economic you know, players um, and the government, but their interests might not necessarily converge. They might be the same, but there are questions, for example, a short-term, a long-term interest that do not necessarily match. And I think that was the problem. It has been a problem in Europe, and I think it will be the problem in the future. Just say if you want to, uh, if you're an employer, you want to get somebody right now. You don't necessarily care that much about the, the, the what the, the the status of that individual is down the road. Although you, we can make the argument that's important, but from the perspective of an employer, that might not be the first priority. Whereas from the government's perspective, which has a longer uh, sort of uh, point of view, that might be indeed a challenge. I'll stop here because my time is up. Thanks. We're on time. Excellent. We've got lots of time for questions. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that now. I just I I'll mention that I did ask some students to prepare some questions, and uh, I will call on them uh, in a minute, but I'm gonna just open up to the floor first and ask, is there anyone who's sitting on a burning question they wanna start us off? Yeah, and I'll just mention that the, the table is mic, so you can just uh, maybe raise your voice a little bit, not in anger, of course, but uh, <laughs> whatever the question may be, but uh, why don't you start us off? So, um, my question is for Suzanne. Oh, please introduce yourself as well. Oh, I'm Kenara, I'm a political science student, a uh, master's student. Um, yeah, so my question is for Suzanne. Uh, it relates to something that, Jerry, you mentioned, is that uh, attitudes, there's still a lot of suspicion towards uh, immigrants, particularly in rural regions. What is the province doing to address that? So it's a great question. How can you address that? Yeah, so, um, um, the really short answer is we're not. We're helping communities address that. So we're, um, uh, over the last couple of years, we've had a number of, of sort of, we call them road shows, where we're out talking with community groups, we're talking with chambers of commerce, we're talking with um, organizations that brought themselves together uh, around the Syrian initiative to talk about what immigration can, what role immigration can play in their community, but then also what they can do as ambassadors in their own community. Um, I don't think it's it's um, a, su a successful endeavor for government to say you need you need to accept immigrants because they're going to benefit your community. Um, but we can leverage partnerships and we can help um, help share evidence, help share stories about about um, about those benefits and help other people tell it for themselves. I just want to add actually, just because you mentioned the ambassador program, like those are phenomenal. I actually attended uh, one of the sessions here just a few months ago because um, sometimes like you don't know what you don't know, right? So the whole thing is when it comes to, uh, you know, when you're hearing stuff in the media and you hear mainstream stuff, like the reality here is this ambassador's uh, program 
uh, was open up to whoever to participate. And it was such a phenomenal event where you had so many different people from different, there were some that were immigrants, there were business leaders, there were uh, non-profit organizations that were attending there. So I gotta tell you, if we could do more of those kind of things, those would be the things that we need to roll out more. Because, hey, I come from a small community in rural Nova Scotia, I can tell you sometimes, it's better, but there's still certain thoughts about exactly, you know, while well, they're, they're taking jobs away. And, and I even kind of had that up on a bullet as protectionism, right? You know, you look at south of the border, what's going on in the U.S. and that stuff is Canada is not recognized as that. We're not the leaders. We're, we're doing some great stuff. To me, Europe, there's a lot of other places that do some phenomenal things. So I, I think really if you look at it here is... Uh, that's going to always exist. It's ugly little head somewheres, but I think the more knowledge and power, and we we uh, educate people, it makes it better. Maybe, maybe I should just explain what the ambassador program is. It's um, we it's operates from ISANS, and it came very much straight after uh, the Syrians started to arrive, and it was responding to the issue of, um, you know, what can I do in my community? So it's developing um, capacity and uh, resources. Uh, in different institutions, organizations, employers, and for them to be able to identify what can they do in their own contexts. Um, and if you want to know any more about it, actually, the person who started developing is Nabiha <laughs> Tala um, from ISANS, who is here. So she, uh, she can explain exactly uh, what's going on. But it's become very, very, a very important part of our, uh, of our work. Sean, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just say it's important not to miss opportunities either, right? The, the whole Syrian refugee resettlement exercise um, was kind of a, a bit unexpected in the way it galvanized Canadian society, really, to, to bring this top of mind. And everybody had this discussion on a very broad level across the country, and this region no different, um, a chance to really engage with people, to see how the process and the program can work, to... To, for a, what I think most people agreed was a very excellent cause, but spread that around to the other angles of immigration as well and include them in that discussion and a chance to have people really, like Jerry said, so what can I do? How can this help my community? Um, and I, at the, about that time, it was October of 2015, I was in front of a group of smaller town uh, mayors and wardens uh, in, from Atlanta, Canada, and I have to say, as a federal bureaucrat who sort of floats around at a very high level, I was reassured in that way to see smaller town, local focused politicians getting very engaged with the issue of immigration and wanting to know more and wanting to be able to, to you know, participate in those benefits at a community level. Eric Levy, where are you? Eric, why don't you start us off? Um, I have a lot, so I'll sit down. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess the first part um, goes to Suzanne. You had mentioned that there are already about 200 employers approved and 80 job offers sent out. Do you have any more information on where those are in the province? Geographically, um, so across the province. Um, one of the interesting things that's happening in the Atlantic Immigration Pilot is um, the, the geographic spread is fundamentally, right now it's about 50% in Halifax and about 50% outside of Halifax, or last I checked the numbers. Um, comparing that to other immigration streams, it's, it's typically about 80% in Halifax and 20% outside of Halifax. So it's really, I think, um, the pilot and all of the things we're talking about, about the Syrian initiative and other things, the, the conversations, the discourse outside of Halifax has changed and employers are paying attention. And so you're seeing that, that shift this year um, in, in how immigration and how communities and employers are taking advantage of immigration. And I guess that leads me to kind of my next pressing question from what you were talking about, um, more related to ISANS, but it relates to sort of this side of the table. Sorry. Um, with that distribution happening, is there um, room for ISANS to move out into the province? Because um, I've heard time and time again, like with uh, being from, I'm from the Annapolis Valley, and uh, people will say issues with retention are a lack of support services, so then people want to move to Halifax, and then the support services are congested, so then they move on. Um, are there plans to expand ISANS um, um, as it sort of it once was? Mm. And then the, um, 
The challenge of that 50% is retention. It is. Yeah. Uh, we know that. Uh, we know that we, we struggle with uh, people who are born in Nova Scotia staying in those rural areas. So, you know, you bring other people in. Big, big issue um, for us. Um, right now, the YMCA um, is providing some services. Um, and when we talk about those numbers, they're still not, it's still around about 80, 83% of people who come, who immigrate to Nova Scotia come to Halifax. So there's still not that many outside. And if they are outside, if you take away the kind of the Syrian refugee, the privately sponsored Syrian refugees, they usually have jobs or they have family. And so the needs are different often to what people in, in Halifax. So we don't have plans right now. We are already providing services across the province um, uh, from, from Halifax, but the YMCA from their um, nine, 12? 11. 11, uh, 11 sites across the province are actually providing that initial settlement uh, piece. And that's fairly new. That's just the last couple of years um, that the YMCA Y Reach program is out there doing the work um, across the province. And they're also providing language training now. So have you seen any change of retention in those uh, communities where the YMCA are? So retention is, we're mm -hmm. sort of shaking our heads. <laughs> retention is a really hard thing to sure. get. Um, good statistics on, good data. Um, the best data that we have is tax filer information and it's a few years out. So mm -hmm. um, Sean and I were talking about even measuring retention of the pilot. Um, it's a much longer term sort of picture um, um, in really being able to understand, understand retention itself. Um, and one of the interesting things we're testing in the pilot is being it, it, different measures to get at retention. So better reporting relationships between employers, for instance, and the province and the federal government. So if your employer leave, or your employee leaves, notify us about that and tell us why. Like, see if you can, we can get some better data on retention. So then are there mechanisms in place within this pilot program to look at retention? Yes, exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep, I'm going to move on to, uh, to Melissa now, if I may. Melissa Nguyen? Okay. Melissa. Hi, okay, you're, you're up. Um, my question to Jerry. Um, in the pilot, they mentioned the importance and responsibility of the employer. For, um, the employer's responsibility? The employer's responsibility. Yeah. Um, so initially, um, the employer needs to know what settlement is because um, when they're endorsed, um, when they're designated and when the, um, the candidate is endorsed, there's a responsibility for the employer to provide um, some settlement um, uh, services or at least ensure that the candidate um, can access those settlement services. And so... The responsibility is on the employer initially to be able to find out what is settlement um, and then down the road it depends you know the the folks that we've seen already that we've done these assessment settlement plans for um, for the most part the spouses um, don't have a job so they're going to be looking for employment so um, it's that role and so that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the, the CME folks need to find the spouse a job. It needs to make sure, you know, where do I, where do I send you if you, need to, uh, if you need to go somewhere? The settlement plan also gives a lot of information for both the employer and um, if the candidate wants to share it with the employer um, and for the candidate, you know, when you get here, assuming that you're already overseas, you're still overseas, um, these are the these are the places that you need to go. But you know, when people arrive, you're talking housing, the kids in school, you know, finding a doctor. It's all those settlement issues um, that it was interesting because we there's um, we can look at the privately sponsored refugees, kind of those wraparound services, and we look at those and say, ha, huh, it's very similar, a different profile but very similar um, that the employer uh, would be um, involved with. Mitch, do you have a, a comment on, on this about the, the demands on the employer and, and to what, it, what reaction you're hearing from, from industry about the expectations around this setup and the information you have to Yeah, it is, I establish. think it's just more, um, like I said, some companies are already set up in terms of they have processes in place that might, you know, on the immigration side, but HR is, uh, perspective may have policies in place but really with this program here there's a lot 
that don't know enough about it to really even make uh, determinations. That's where I, I think what's important here is when you have ISANS and you have Department of Immigration is you're going to actually have these organizations working together because, like I said, there's some small organizations. They're, they're wearing multiple hats and that stuff, and they're just, it, it's more, how do I say this, but deer in the headlights in terms of, well, what does this mean to me? That's why you're getting resistance in terms of they don't want to, it's not that they don't want to go down the, the avenue of this road and actually bring people in, but there's there's so much use to actually the processes in place. Well, I can just go recruit. I'll, I'll call a recruitment company. I can get somebody local, and that is not the case. So, so like I said, it's it's I think it's a year in its making here so far, mm -hmm. and I think as things evolve and, and more collaboration with the right parties uh, and the right groups, it, it'll be better, but it's still really up in the air. May I ask a, a follow-up on just on this point, and perhaps it's for uh, our uh, government agencies, actually. Is this pilot better suited towards medium-sized companies that have some capacity that want to grow, or has this got a small company in mind, or is that not relevant, or how, how would you react to this? Like, do you really need some excess capacity to really excel at this program. If I can turn off. Yeah, sure. So I'll tell you, for the eight or nine months we spent, the federal government and the provincial government at the table talking about this program, the SME was at the forefront of our conversation. So um, like I said, immigration is never going to be easy, but if we can make it as easy as possible for that employer, that's that's what was driving our conversation. Um, and so as, as Mitch sort of, is sort of talking about, if you have a labor need that is persistent and it's impacting your growth or your bottom line, we're gonna try and help you fill that. Um, but at the same time, we also wanna test out um, if you bring something to, to the table on settlement, does that enhance our retention? And so uh, if I can just gear away from the question and follow up on, on the original question, um, these services that we're talking about for employers, for newcomers, they exist outside of the AIP as well. But what's interesting about the pilot is making it a mandatory part of the program, really testing out to see does that enhance outcomes. If you're forcing a conversation early on about with the employer, are you ready to hire an immigrant? And with uh, a newcomer and their family, are you ready and prepared for Nova Scotia? Um, does that lead to better outcomes for everybody? Yeah, and I would say that if you're gonna make people go through all of that work, Right, of learning how the program works, recruiting someone internationally, attracting them here, hiring them, onboarding them, et cetera. We wanna make sure that the settlement is durable, the integration happens, so that you don't lose that effort right, when they depart for some other place. Um, so obviously the settlement piece, having the employer take a role there, um, because often, as was said earlier, the job is sort of the first thing that connects the immigrant to the place, but there's a lot more to it than just that. And Jerry mentioned family and community, and of course, extending the employer's responsibility of connecting the new immigrants' family members with services as well to sort of get the whole wraparound uh, approach. Um, you know, we're hopeful will yield some of those results. Um, more directly to in terms of how employers actually have to grapple with the mechanics of the program, uh, being a government program is probably never as simple as business will want it to be. But we have made some efforts, certainly at the federal level. We've introduced uh, more of a, a hand-holding approach, a dedicated service channel where employers can go to get help specifically with what the next steps are for them in terms of helping their candidate uh, go through the permanent residence application process, for example. There's someone that they can actually get on the phone, which hasn't been an easy thing to do with our department for quite a while. Melissa, do you have any follow-up on that, or does that uh, satisfy your question? Um, no, it's okay. I'll let someone else go. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, please, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I'm Lisa Roberts. I'm the um, NDP MLA for Halifax Needham and the Nova Scotia NDP um, spokesperson on immigration. Um, Suzanne, I wanted to just ask or, or push a little bit on the role of, of government in being welcoming, because I am hearing that even though um, it's community's jobs and it's, it's all of our jobs, um, at the level of frontline government staff, at the level of um, frontline healthcare workers, just as one example, I'm hearing stories about um, the, the crisis that the IWK emergency can be thrown into when parents arrive who only speak Arabic and there's nobody in the hospital who speaks Arabic, for example. 
So, so what on a whole government, recognizing that government services in, you know, exist across the province, how are we responding in terms of trying to, to make sure that people can get the services that they need in all parts of their life? So um, I think two things, and um, just following back on the original question about government's role, I want to be clear that government is a leader, and we set the tone, um, both the federal and provincial governments. Um, I think our response both to the Ivany Commission and to uh, the Syria Initiative, it sets the tone for Nova Scotians about, about being welcoming and about what, um, what we can do as a province. Um, in terms of government services, I would say we've come a long way over the last couple of years. Certainly, um, again, pointing to the response to the Syrian initiative, uh, you see departments that are that are focused on immigration and having conversations about how they um, enhance their services for newcomers. Departments like the uh, community services, for instance, who have hired, who had hired, have hired Arabic um, speaking caseworkers to work in the department. Um, and uh, maybe, Jerry, you can talk a bit about the IW UK example, um, because again, uh, responding to the Syrian initiative really made us all of all of the partners around the table sort of go, okay, we need to think about how we do things a bit differently. So the, yeah, so the the health uh, department actually has been really responsive. Um, five years ago. Um, at Isans, we had a, we had an office, and we had paper over the window, and we had a bed there, and we had twelve doctors who volunteered to to for uh, refugees as they come in because we couldn't get refugees in to see a doctor. Um, things changed. Um, we now have a refugee health clinic, uh, both for refugees uh, and for refugee claimants who are coming in. You know, it's part of the system. It made a huge difference. And I have to say that the, um, the Syrian refugee, and we keep mentioning this, um, but it made an incredible difference. Because what happened is um, many people, many educated, uh, influential people suddenly went, huh, that's interesting. Um, for instance, social assistance rates um, are not what, um, are what they should be. Uh, but your neighbor, actually, forget refugees from it, your neighbor um, is, uh, is on those social assistance rates. Well, you can't get, a ha you can't get any uh, affordable housing. Um, huh, well, your neighbor can't get any affordable housing as well. So it created a lot of conversation, and not only in Halifax, because there were 1,500-ish um, uh, Syrian refugees came into Nova Scotia. Around 500 of those, um, 400 of those, were outside Halifax. So those conversations were happening outside Halifax as well. Uh, so it's been interesting uh, where people have started to really look at themselves and look through the lens of what does it mean to me to be more welcoming? And, you know, we, can, we play our role, but uh, you're right, you know, and it's not good enough, honestly. It's not good enough to say, well, it's everybody's role to be welcoming. Um, and so we all need to be the leaders. Uh, I want to go to Matt and ask him for his question. Is it Matt Cowood? Yeah, Kaywood. Kaywood, Matt, go ahead, please. I'm MBA student. Uh, my question is primarily uh, directed at Sudan. Um, is enough currently being done to detect like, fraudulent or unfair practices among Saturday immigrants or the border? So, great question, actually. We. Um, 2016, um, we actually implemented a, a system in our in our department that didn't exist before of called program integrity. So we've actually got um, uh, former police officers doing investigations into applications exactly to detect those types of things. Um, uh, interestingly, the number of files that we've rescinded because of suspected fraud or nominations we've refused because of su suspected fraud have gone up, uh, which we think is a good thing because it means we're catching things we might not have caught before, um, and certainly working with organizations like the Canada Border Services Agency, with um, Federal Immigration, of course they do, as Sean mentioned, they are the gatekeepers, they are the final approvers, and so uh, the federal government, um, and Sean can talk about this, has their own system of security checks, uh, fraud checks, uh, and that kind of thing. Sure, it's not something that's new, right? This yeah. is a new immigration program, but the risk of fraud in the immigration system is not new. We've been dealing with, with this probably as long as we've had them to some degree. Um, so certainly in our department, we have 
some fairly robust frameworks of risk analysis that we use to inform our staff of how we assess things, the different requirements that we have. We look at the documentation, we look at the evidence available. We, have, we try to push the information out to the frontline staff so they can make those determinations. We have resources available both within our own department that are more specialized in risk and fraud analysis, but also, as Susan mentioned, um, cooperatively with the Canada Border Services Agency, which has a sort of higher order responsibility for enforcement um, in where we share administration of the same legislation. Um, so certainly it's a, it's a well-recognized issue uh, in our department and our partner departments. Um, and Susan, I mentioned that with the rest of the public safety portfolio as well, we get along very, very well and I think cooperate very well together. Um, it's not something that we necessarily talk about really, really detailed, um, but uh, it's, it's definitely a, um, a live concern. Um, it's something that we're also trying to apply more and more technology to, try and get to grips more quantitatively with the issue. Um, which will, in future, I think, uh, influence more of how we approach the issue and, and develop policy. Um, but it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's well recognized and we're working on it. <laughs> I'd like to bring Ruben into the conversation at this point because I know he has interest in, in security. Um, so I'm going to ask a question. Let me ramble a little bit, but uh, I'll get there. It's uh, I was watching uh, the interview with somebody we talk about on campus all the time, our favorite person, Steve Bannon. Uh, former staffer at the White House. He was interviewed by 60 Minutes, of course, on the weekend and uh, rejected any idea that immigration was the foundation of American success, that it was really about uh, financial institutions, protecting the manufacturing base, and border security. That those are the three keys to American success. I, I think that's, it's fair to summarize it that way. I, th I believe he, that's the way he, w he said. So um, Thinking also about some of the, the drama that's unfolded in Europe as well, you've got this, this kind of rise of nationalism that's going to populism going on in the United States and Europe. Um, so two-part question, why aren't we seeing that here? And two, if what do you think? And two, um, this issue that comes up about you know some of these programs and these pilots being maybe in some cases ahead of the population right, that maybe we're talking about immigration policies and programs that not everybody's ready for. Is there a risk that we go a little bit further than popular opinion and then something flares up as a result? Yeah, I'll start from the second question because it's pertinent to the discussion we're having here. Again, when I provide you just a European perspective, I think the, the good, good example of how going too far into trying to implement something that from many different perspectives is considered to be positive and ha might have positive implications for the population, but that might backfire. Provide the example of the United Kingdom. Some, some of you might be aware of the fact that the United Kingdom is still part of, a, a member of the European Union, but has last year there was a referendum, so the UK is you know, in the process of leaving this regional um, organization. And one of the key sort of topics uh, that sort of all, most commentators would uh, point to as be the key factor in deciding the referendum one way or another, in this case for a no, or sort of leave the EU, was migration. The UK has been for, I would say, for a long period of time, but certainly in the last 20 years, a place that has attracted a lot of migrants, it's been it presented itself as open uh, to migrants, not just Europeans, but from around the world. And uh, I think one element that is not being considered that explicitly in some of these discussions is that this has been something that the government has sort of put forward. And uh, for example, when the, some um, Eastern European countries joined the European Union you know, around 10 years ago, the UK was one of the few countries within Europe that allowed citizens of those countries to move and work and live uh, in, uh, in the UK, um, and what that meant in practice is a lot of uh, Romanians, uh, Polish uh, citizens moved to the country. Economic analysis of their impact has been overall positive, but the problem was that the, the government did not necessarily consider the implications of this, this, uh, this, these numbers of individuals coming to the country, so services were not provided to match the distribution of those migrants, and we, when we talk about the, the, the central and local, the rural and the urban, 
in the UK, a lot of those migrants ended up actually, well, most of them in London and the big centers, but also in the rural areas because those migrants are mostly non-skilled. So that's one of the differences here probably. But in rural areas that are not, were not ready to um, welcome those migrants that did not have the, the services that were mm -hmm. necessary to make sure that those migrants could integrate. And so what happened, I think that this simplifying the issue, but there was a backlash and then led to not only a uh, populist wave within the UK, but also ended up even to, uh, to the point where the UK decided to leave the EU, which is a political block, but also an economic block. So it meant that it's this inward spiral has, um, has been unleashed. And that's, again, to answer, so the answer to your question is yes. Sometimes governments, even when they have the sort of a very, um, so they see that the positive aspects of a particular project, project might not necessarily consider some of the, the backlash you might have here in Canada. Uh, uh, sorry, in a particular population. I'm not an expert of Canada, so I cannot necessarily answer why that might not be the case here, but I think this is something that should definitely be kept into consideration. Because one way to do that is to try to engage the, the population, but what if there are those sentiments, those feelings are not overcome, then, then it might be a challenge to make sure that the, the particular projects are implemented correctly. Okay. Abdu's question. Please. Thank you very much. <coughs> I am Abdu, Kente from Ibrahim for South Africa. Um, my question will be directed to Sin. You will explain uh, <coughs> a little about the strategy, the, the Atlantic growth uh, strategy. And uh, I would like to know how contingent, how contingent is the strategy to compensate or minimize the brain drain suffering of countries where immigrants come from? I think we're talking about the, the gains for Canada, the gains for Atlantic provinces, the gains in program. But what about the other side of the coin? Especially, you talked about attracting international graduates, international students. Yes. These are people who come from countries that, that obviously need them too. It is important to factor what kind of contribution could they also make when they're over here. Even though they become temporary residents or they become permanent residents, what connections are available for them and how does that kind of factor them? How, how would that be coordinated to ensure their countries also don't lose them permanently to Canada? It's a gain for you, but a drain for them. Right. Okay. So how contingent is the, is the strategy? Yep. Right. One thing I'd point out to start with is that we know that immigration is not just a gain for Canada, right? When we have people who come to Canada, like you said, either temporary or permanently, and in the case you mentioned of international students, if they do decide to stay, not all of them do, right? We've opened opportunities for those who want to, to stay. Not all of them necessarily do. But for those who do stay, we know they don't leave where they came from entirely behind, right? They may at some point establish a life for themselves here in Canada, but they have and they retain their connections and we don't ask them to give up on their connections to where they came from either. This is a net benefit to both countries, I think, right? You're building bridges across those gaps, um, connections that are both social and economic in the end, right? A lot of people, if, if a new immigrant to Canada might start a new business here, right? One of the things they might have in mind is what they know about where they came from in terms of potential for supplies, goods, services, et cetera, that they could then also sell in Canada or vice versa, right? Deliver things, Canadian exports to their contacts and network and things they know about where they came from. And so I, I don't think we should think about it just purely as a gain for Canada and a loss for somewhere else. I think there's, there's a connection and an exchange that continues to happen that we build there. Um, it, it's, uh, it's important to recognize too that we open an opportunity for people to choose, right? That's what the immigration legislation does. We're allowing people to come in when they choose to come to Canada, right? Or they choose to stay in Canada. Um, to some extent, if someone's decided to leave where they are because of conditions that are affecting them or a choice that they decide to make, um, 
we can allow them to come here or we can watch them go somewhere else. Uh, so we're not, um, it's, it's a thing we recognize though, it's true, right? That there can be loss of some professional capacity or, or skills or things to certain places. But I think what we've recognized over time is like going back to what I said earlier, it's not necessarily permanent, right? People won't always stay here. There's still always a chance to go back and to spend some time in both places. We try to make most of our programs flexible. Right? A permanent resident in Canada can retain their status, for example, while staying in Canada only two years out of every five. So it allows them ample latitude to continue to, to straddle the gap a bit. Uh, I want to make sure I get Nabdi's question in because we're almost out of time. Nabdi, your question. Uh, my question is directed to um, Jerry. Um, you are the director of the Veggies Immigration Settlement in Settlement in Canada. And, um, you said something about um, bringing folks here, yeah, and you said folks would bring their spouse and children, and I'm going to put you in your own ways. We need those folks. So your statement seems to be focused on um, people who are not already in Canada, and then you need these folks to come to Canada with your spouses, children, family. Um, meanwhile, I think that um, statement kind of um, neglects the um, the um, foreign people that are already here and mm -hmm. my focus is um, on students. So um, in my own experience I've um, come across people who who are permanent residents. Um, I came across one over this summer. He's from India and um, he has his permanent residence. And I was like, how long have you been in Canada? He mm -hmm. said, um, I think he said something like three months. And I'm like, whoa, how is that possible? And he said, well, my elder brother, he's an electrical engineer, so he applied for BRO from India. He got approved after six months, and then he came over here with his family. So that BRO extended not just to his wife, children, but also to his younger brother and his other younger siblings. Um, meanwhile, the case for international students over here, if I'm wrong, correct me, um, for international students here, after your education, maybe four years or six years, depending if you decide to do masters, or maybe nine years if you decide to go to push your PhD, those years of education don't count. It's like once you're through with school, the clock resets and you have to what the process um, maybe work for two or three years, apply for something else, and then after maybe a few months or years, and then break the exam or so. Um, I think that's not fair to international students that they would um, invest so much money in tuition um, and then after that they still have to those years don't count. Meanwhile somebody from overseas can just um, you know buy his way through. Okay let's I, I think that's <coughs> a good question. Maybe we need some clarification whether that's the policy. So um, if I can, so I'm chomping at the bit to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a so great a question. Of minutes, so it's a yeah, great please. question, and it, Suzanne, actually, you want to go first? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I'm so glad that you asked that question in a room of potential candidates to the program. Um, so your education absolutely counts. International students, international graduates um, in our programs in Nova Scotia are a priority of the provincial government and of the federal government. Um, currently there's, I, I forgot our brochure for international <coughs> students, but there's about four different ways that you can immigrate post-graduation that your education counts for. Um, one of them, if you have a year of work experience in Canada, in Nova Scotia, it's extremely fast. It's the fastest program, I think, in all of immigration. We're um, processing in three weeks and the federal government's processing uh, six months or less and in many cases much much less than six months if you don't have a year of work experience yet but you have a job offer the Atlantic immigration pilot is 
you can come right away as soon as you've graduated. And that is an advantage nobody else has in the country. Um, so it's a huge opportunity for international graduates in Atlantic Canada and in Nova Scotia in particular. Um, and I'm probably missing other streams, but there's, there's a myriad of ways um, that you can immigrate permanently. And as an international student, maybe Sean can t talk a bit about uh, post-grad work permit. It's a program that is incredibly valuable. Right. So the, the circumstances of an individual who makes their permanent residence application, right, the, 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 they just need to meet the criteria. Sort of when they apply, whether you do it before you do studies in Canada or after, right, the criteria are there and they're open, the application process is open to, to everyone, sort of any time, right? So you don't have to necessarily wait until after your education. It's a matter of whether or not you meet the criteria that, you know, Parliament and the government have established. But certainly, the, our department and previous ministers in our department and the present minister have highlighted that international students are excellent candidates for permanent residence in Canada. And in fact, over the last year, we've made several changes to programming and the systems that we use to increase the value we place on education in Canada for potential candidates for immigration. Um, certainly, Suzanne mentioned the, um, the postgraduate work permit program, which has been running now for three, four, five years at least, um, where people who complete a degree in Canada, right, two years or more, um, will be able to work in just about any job they like for up to three years, right? So there's ample opportunity to gain Canadian work experience there that we're offering to just about everyone who graduates from post-secondary in Canada. Um, that experience in Canada then continues to open lots of doors, right, for various immigration programs. And in <coughs> fact, just this past uh, November 2016, we adjusted the express entry system to give extra points for having completed post-secondary education in Canada, right, which was not there before, but which was specifically done to recognize the experience, the networking, the knowledge of Canada, the sort of integration that international students have already been accomplishing while they've been in Canada studying. Um, so certainly I think that international students are particularly well-placed to do well in federal programs, right? So we've tried to maximize the opportunities that they have and place some particular value on the time that we've spent here, that they've spent here. When you talk about the number of years and the time doesn't count, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't agree because like I said, we do put additional sort of value or points in our ranking systems and things like that available for having completed that education in Canada. Um, the other way that I think people refer to time not counting has more pertinence to the citizenship portion, right, after people become permanent residents and transition to citizenship. And Parliament just uh, recently passed the, the government's bill to change some of those rules around citizenship. Now to go back to offering recognition for some of the time people have spent as temporary residents before they became permanent residents to credit also towards their eligibility for citizenship. I, I am mindful of time. I'm gonna, Jerry. The question was directed to you. Do you have anything <laughs> to add if I give you one minute, have you got anything? Ditto. To add? That's fine. Okay. I, I just want to say though that um, in the in the immigration world, international students are honestly the priority. I would say um, they are uh, for both the federal and the provincial government because there's a recognition that uh, you know that qualification um, is Canadian, and you know there's not that. Um, uh, challenge to be able to for employers to actually look at something that's uh, that's not uh, uh, from Canada. So absolutely. Um, Good comment so, to end on. So definitely I hope things your, go well. Uh, definitely playing to your crowd, uh, university okay. students of priority. Um, no, actually, I ha we're already five minutes over. I'm sorry. So we're going to have to say thank you so much uh, for coming. This is a very juicy conversation. I'm looking forward to the roundtable. Um, I'm going to. Uh, Present our panelists with uh, some tokens of our appreciation. When they get to the round table, I will present them on your behalf and on Dalhousie's behalf and the McKechnie Institute's behalf. But for the time being, join me in thanking our panelists for coming today. Thank you.